thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, and it's a nice big crowd here. We all like beer, right? So it's a good thing to talk about. No, I'm, yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you all for joining us this afternoon. A couple of quick announcements before we get started. Um, if you do have a cell phone on you or something that makes noise, if you'd put that on silent or vibrate or um, just to not interrupt the presenter. Um, we'll hear for, from Carl um, for a bit and then we'll do a q and I'll walk around with the microphone so that if you have a question, everybody in the audience can hear it. Um, and I also just wanted to remind everyone that we are here at Fairhaven Senior Services and they ask that when you're in the public areas that you do please put your mask on. Um, so just a reminder to do that when you're in the, in the hallways and stuff. Um, but let's go ahead and get started for today. I'm Carrie Bourne. I'm from the Office of Continuing Education at UW-Whitewater. And we have hosted the Fairhaven Lecture Series here at Fairhaven Senior Services since 1983. Um, and we're really happy to be back after a couple years of um, not being able to be with you folks. Um, and today's presenter has has um, been here a few different times and we're happy to have him back. He's Dr. Carl Brown and he's an associate professor in the Department of History at UW-Whitewater. He received his PhD and MA from the University of Texas at Austin and his BA from Lawrence University in Appleton. His research focuses on society in post-war Eastern Europe, particularly communist Hungary, in the late 1940s through mid-1950s. In addition to his teaching and research work at several institutions in the US, Dr. Brown has worked as the lead brewer at breweries in Japan and the director of brewing operations at Greek Brewery in Athens. Please welcome Dr. Carl Brown. All right, well, thank you for that. Gentlemen, is, is the sound all right back there? Are we good? Okay, good. Well, folks, first off, I, I, don't, I don't know if y'all are aware of this, but Carrie Bourne works really hard to put together these uh, lecture series uh, for you guys, and I think we should, that, that we should give her a hand right now. And as Carrie mentioned, my dissertation research was on um, everyday crime and uh, popular resistance in communist Hungary up until 1956. So if you have questions about, uh, about the black market or illegal pig killing or the hooligan jazz scene in communist Hungary, I can address those. More recently though, uh, my research has turned towards, well, um, I've been doing drugs. I've been researching drugs more accurately. Um, the history of various substances, the transnational connections, opium wars and things like that. So I really got into prohibition in Wisconsin. It's a fascinating topic. And um, I'll apologize in advance that some of you may have heard parts of this uh, talk before, talking about the, the prohibition myths, but I also have some brand new content for you. For, well, it's uh, 100 years old, but it's, uh, it's uh, some, some of my more recent research focusing specifically on breweries in Wisconsin uh, in the early phases of prohibition. Okay, um, let's see. I've been told that I speak too swiftly at times. So if I start doing so, please give me some sort of gesture to slow me down. And I'll also pause for questions intermittently. But if something, if you have a burning question, please just uh, shoot your hand up, and we'll go from there. Okay. Um, so, brewing in early America. Now, the, the beer, of course, they're brewing. The understanding of how to brew beer comes over on the on, on the Mayflower with the colonists, and um, the way th and for the most part, uh, households that would uh, simply brew enough beer for their consumption on a regular basis. This was part of all those labels uh, labeled women's work uh, back in the day. It was simply a part of household uh, production, right? Now, some farmsteads did brew enough that they could sell some to uh, neighbors. Those are called ordinaries. This is basically somebody who had a slightly larger living room, about four or five seats for folks to come in and drinks. But then as the um, uh, frontier heads westward, we also see a, a shift from home brewing to proper breweries, taverns, tap houses. The very first brewery is founded in New York City by Block and Christensen in 1612, but then thereafter uh, we see breweries uh, showing up in Milwaukee as early as the 1840s uh, and soon thereafter. The images here are from Old World Wisconsin, which now has a uh, historically accurate brew house. Have any of you been there yet? Uh, okay, D time for a field trip, folks. It's fast. It's a great structure. The folks there are really friendly. It's a really fun trip uh, uh, to go on. So early brewing starts out at the home, switches to uh, uh, breweries proper on about 19th century. And uh, here in Wisconsin, very first uh, brewery founded is the Monroe, now the Minhas Brewery. Um, 
And of course, by the mid-19th century, you've got a lot of folks coming to this country, a lot of them from Germany. And at this point, the Erie Canal has been constructed, so they can skip straight past the East Coast and get straight to Milwaukee. Think of Milwaukee as basically the, the Normandy beach of the German invasion of the Midwest, if you will, right? Um, and even today, Wisconsin is, has a higher percentage of people of ethnic German descent than any other state in this country. Quick show of hands, how many of you are of ethnic German ancestry? Comes as no surprise. At the time in question around Prohibition, about 85% of Wisconsinites are either of German extraction or, or first generation or, or new immigrants, right? So, brewing starts in Wisconsin 1845, as does the temperance movement. In this case, the Sons of Temperance, founded the same year as the Monroe Brewery. Um, but, of course, we're much more familiar with the Women's Christian Temperance Union. And this leads us to, I think, uh, the, the, the two main ideas I think we have to stress about prohibition, I think, are, are I do it in the form of de debunking myths. I think that there is a common conception that prohibition was mostly the fault of people like Carrie Nat Nation going into bars and hacking them to shreds with her axe. And I think there's also a widespread conviction that prohibition didn't work. I'm going to address that later on and come back to it. I want to talk about how that, um, I, I want to ask us to think more carefully about that as well, okay? Um, so, first off, the temperance movement. By the late 19th century, saloons are, um, uh, they're definitely all male spaces. Uh, dr public drinking uh, has a very seedy, kind of sketchy character to it. Uh, women were not, well, the, the proper types of women wouldn't be found dead in saloons. And, um, and uh, many women, um, I think rightfully, uh, saw the source of many social evils in the tavern, in the saloon. Men would go spend their salaries on alcohol instead of their families, come home, domestic violence would ensue. I mean, the linkage of saloons with things wrong in society makes a lot of sense. Moreover, of course, women don't have the vote as yet, right? Not until, well, not until Wisconsin's the first to ratify in uh, 1920. And so this really, the temperance movement was really the only way that women had to make their voices heard in public, to advocate for the changes that they wanted to see happen in society. Um, right, so this is perhaps not surprisingly then that, that after the Seneca Falls uh, Conference in 1846, there's a lot of crossover between the temperance movement and the suffragists agitating for the vote for women. This is, these are the ways that women can try to assert themselves in the public sphere um, as it's dominated by men, right? Um, so, WC, as early as, as 1873, uh, Carrie starts hacking uh, saloons to shreds. Um, the, the, the bar at the state house in um, Iowa, I think, she went into and hacked up and got arrested, of course. And that was when she started uh, selling axes that she'd uh, signed to pay, for her, uh, 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 to pay for her court fees. So she, she was actually a very skillful uh, 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 manipulator of public opinion. Um, so, as of 1893, this is how temperance is doing. Not so well, right? Uh, the Dakotas are dry, as is Kansas, as is part of Oklahoma, but in the rest of the country, it wouldn't, wasn't too hard to find yourself someplace uh, to buy some alcohol or consume it in a tavern. Um, enter part two of the temperance movement, and that's the Anti-Saloon League. Founded in 1893, a lot of crossover, a lot of collaboration with the WCTU, but a very different organization. The ASL is pretty much really the first uh, single issue driven lobby, I think is the best way to think about it. These are activists who would uh, support candidates simply on the basis of whether they were dry or not. They could be of either political party, they could have radical political beliefs, but as long as they're dry, you would get support from the ASL. Okay, so, so we have the, a major lobby now advocating for temperance as well. And um, the, uh, the, the legal device here is the so-called local option. Even if a state is still wet, even if state law still says that you can buy and drink alcohol, individual counties and townships can decide to go dry themselves and uh, that impose that new law upon uh, their people. Now, of course, you could step across the county line to get alcohol and bring it on back. Um, but this, the, 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 lo the local option results in many places going dry prior to prohibition proper. Um, company towns, such as for the, the Pullman, um, the Henry Ford, of course, uh, uh, the, these company towns were often dry towns as well. So if you worked at that factory and lived in that company town, you couldn't buy alcohol there either, right? So the point here is that by 1909, fully half of Americans, this is a decade before Prohibition proper, but already as of 1909, half of Americans couldn't drink in the counties they lived in, right? Let's take a look at um, a map, okay? So including three entirely dry states, 
So the, the combination of temperance and the ASL, the, 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 the lobbying organization, they've had some serious successes by the eve of World War I, right? A couple things to keep in mind, though, is that again, one can still get to some place you can buy alcohol. One can still get to some place one can buy alcohol pretty easily, and also interstate commerce in alcohol is not regulated. That this is still the province of the federal government, right? Um, so, show me the money. 1913, the 16th Amendment establishes the individual personal income tax, and up until this point in time, the single largest source of revenue for the American government was taxes on breweries. Right? So if there was to be a concerted effort to, uh, to go dry, to ban alcohol, well, that's going to hit the government right in the pocketbook. Right? So it's really up until the advent of this personal income tax uh, that the, the, the government made so much money off of brewing it simply couldn't afford, couldn't afford to touch it. Right? So this changes in 1913. Uh, at this point, the government doesn't rely as much on income from breweries. Also in 1913, the Webb Canyon Act is passed banning interstate commerce in alcohol. So we see both the financial and the legal framework of prohibition coming along about a, 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 um, almost a decade before prohibition, right? Any questions on anything so far? No? Okay. Yes, sir. You're not doing it by the client. I'm assuming this is okay in any way you have it, right? Um, pretty, I mean, pretty much, yeah. The, 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 if I buy it somewhere else, I can drink it at home? Yeah, yeah, as a rule, absolutely, right. Okay, so here on the eve of the World War, long comes World War I, um, which from the standpoint of this German artist, it's obviously a question of this horrible, gaping Russian maw, uh, which today is, I think, maybe more accurate than we like to um, address. Oh, sorry, too soon? Um, but <laughs> so the, the World War I breaks out, uh, so this, the, the, this crisis for, for the world, and um, in this country, the war is one of the major things that, drive, that, that end up getting us prohibition in a couple of complex ways. Um, first off, during World War I, there's a lot of grain rationing, and we have to use that grain to bake bread for our boys overseas, and so distilleries close down entirely, and breweries have to dramatically limit their production. This has two effects. Uh, they, they make much less money, and, that, and they can't pay for their lobbyists to go up against the ASL. And there's also a legal uh, a precedent for um, slowing or stopping brewing in this country as a result of the wartime uh, 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 phenomenon, right? Um, secondly, uh, the U.S. Brewing Association has links to the National German American Association as sort of a group for ethnic Germans, uh, which was fine until 1914, but starts getting suspect immediately thereafter. And then there's a, a scandal where um, uh, it is revealed that the USBA is the one bankrolling the German American Alliance, uh, the German American Association, to a large degree. And if you think about the, the, the wave of anti-German sentiment that sweeps this country uh, with World War I, right? This is when uh, New Berlin becomes New Berlin, right? This is when my mother's family name, Mueller, becomes Muller. Uh, I mean, the, this, the, the, this is a moment at which being German was, it was absolutely suspect. Um, and then, so think about all the names of all the major breweries. Pabst, Bush, Anheuser, Heilemann. Right, These, uh, the, the, there's a way in which this anti-German sentiment becomes directed at the big breweries as a result of World War One. Um, Germans were a little po unpopular, during, as, you, as we should be able to figure out from this image. Um, okay, so this then this then gets us prohibition. The, 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 it, it look, blaming Carrie Nation for it is unduly simplistic. There's a number of phenomena, long and short term, culminating with World War One that really, I think, are the things that make prohibition happen. Volstead Act itself was passed in October 1919. Prohibition goes into effect January 20, 20th. But the first, uh, okay, so let me back up and explain my actual research. If you go to the National Archives and Record Administration in Chicago, and you go into Record Group 21, uh, you're going to be handed a bunch of large binders, uh, large, covered in red uh, red leather. They're, they're, they're sizable. They're, they're a... I'd say three feet by two, four feet by two. And in them you have in um, early 20th century handwriting with all of its curlicues and flourishes, uh, records of all the uh, cases at the district court level um, during, the, uh, during this time period. Um, what we find, once we get 1920, the vast majority of cases have this prohibition. I'm talking out of about 400 cases per year, 396 have to do with prohibition. 
for, for 1921, there was that many. Then there was one for narcotics, because the uh, Harrison Narcotics Act has also passed in 1919. And there were a couple cases for people who were trespassing on um, wildlife preserves or something, probably prohibition related, as they were bootlegging, right? So this is, I mean, this is the single sheer most important focus of these district cases. And once you go into those big red uh, books, then you ask, then you uh, do calls for particular cases, and they show up in these cardboard boxes where they've been folded into thirds and wedged in there. Nobody's looked at them for uh, until me, as far as I can tell. Um, and you kind of have to scroll in through there and try not to rip them as you um, go through these hundred year old documents. So, broad overview: what we see at the outset is a number of cases where people are busted for distilling. Uh, their own alcohol. Um, and in this, uh, the, the striking thing about this is a number of cases listed um, large stocks of raisins as among the reasons you could get busted. Does anybody have any idea why that might be? Raisins. How, how are raisins illicit all of a sudden? W well, what do we make with grapes? And a raisin is the as the, the this I mean it's it's wine in your pocket basically it's easy to transport it's easy to convert into fermentables which you can then distill into alcohol so in these early cases again mostly distilling and you'll see people I mean when people did get arrested they would throw the book at them they would have they, 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 most ones I saw had at least six counts against them for possession of a still possession of raisins possession of other of, of other equipment possession of finished product or also documented sales to others they would just they would just throw them straight into jail right that's what it looks like in 1920-21. Now getting more towards 21-22 we see more uh, more bootlegging more sort of more more complex. Uh, organizations having to do with bringing alcohol down from Canada for the most part up around here. But what I what started popping up to me, given my interest in brewing and beer, is how breweries are turning up in these um, documents as well. When I think about prohibition, I think about bathtub gin and speakeasies and generally trying to keep production and consumption on the sly, right? Now, how do you do that with a full brewery? When you fire up that brew house to make beer, you are generating steam. The whole town smells like beer, you know, uh, that great beer brewing smell we're all familiar with. This is a very hard process to keep hidden. And so what I want to do now is walk us through sort of the three major episodes of crackdowns on breweries that I found. In each case, it's for them brewing illegally when they don't um, w uh, after pro – in each case, they're for brewing illegally – but I think when they happen is really interesting, okay? Uh, first off, Blatt's, uh, historic Wisconsin brew house. 24th July, 1919, they get busted for um, illegal brewing. The Volstead Act hasn't even passed yet. Prohibition doesn't go into effect until the 1st January 1920, but they're violating the Wartime Production Act. Remember how brewing was uh, restricted during the war? The war's over, but the law is still in effect, so they can get taken to court for brewing, even though the original rationale for that is, <laughs> is over in November 1918, right? So the first cases we see of breweries getting busted for brewing during Prohibition actually come along before Prohibition, on the heels of the Wartime Production, uh, production Act, right? Wave two is um, four in the summer of 1920, four different breweries, Clinkert, Radiant, Stir, and the Walter Brothers are all raided on uh, charges for illegal brewing. And um, let's see, in each of these, this is a between 100 and a 75 barrel brew house. Uh, one barrel is 31 gallons, so two regular kegs. So we're talking brewing 300, uh, sorry, 200 kegs at a time, 150 kegs at a time. Um, and in each case, they're shut down and they're fined up to around $1,000. In uh, modern dollars, that would be 14000 bucks. So pretty stringent penalties. Um, but the fact that they're still brewing well into prohibition, I think, is also noteworthy. Um, let me ask, how do you think brewers might have been able to get away with breaking the law in such a flagrant fashion? I think, that's, I think that's almost exactly right. We'll come back to that with, uh, with our next brewery. And that, oh, sorry, here's a sample of, uh, okay. So, 19, uh, let's go back. These are all from 1920. I didn't find any 1921. We would think that maybe they've managed to, to crush all the brewers, put them out of business. 
But along comes Fred Rahr in 1922. Rahr brewing up in Green Bay. Um, this is the first page of the affidavit um, that, um, that, that begins the set of files dealing with the Rahr Brewery's uh, 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 closure by prohibition. Uh, this is the first of three pages because they go on to throw the book at Rar. Uh, he's uh, found guilty. F- sorry, he's indicted on fifty separate counts of. Um, um, okay, so th- th- there's a photograph for the brewery. Some of their advertising prior to that, January 22, they're rated. Uh, they're selling. Uh, so they're brewing 100 barrels at a time, 200 kegs at a time. They're selling in kegs. They're selling in bottles. Um, they are selling to certain people. Uh, on a number of different occasions, going back to September 1921. So they were observing the brewery. I mean, they were, they were, the, 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 the feds were keeping an eye on them four months before they make the final bust, and they observed all of these recurrent sales over and over and over. They bust them for brewing on seven different occasions. And coming back to how they didn't get closed down until this point in time, we note among their uh, customers the local Elks Club. And one suspects that some of these other folks who one should, a good historian would go ahead and track down, but I'm just going to make stuff up about them. But, uh, sorry, one suspects that a number of these other people they sold to are similarly, you know, likewise local, uh, you know, sort of the, 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 the town fathers and mothers rather than some sketchy uh, speakeasy type folks. Um, so this is as far as I've gotten with this research. Again, there's 400 cases a year. <laughs> so you only go so fast in the archives. But I hope to get back down to Chicago to, to follow up on this and other stories. Um, OK, so then here's, so, so we, saw the, uh, we saw the indictment here. Again, it goes for three pages. Where it, where it closes with him. The act of running a brewery uh, during Prohibition was called a, a, a common and public nuisance. That was the actual legal category of that offense, thus my title today. Um, three pages of uh, indictment, and then this is his bail. Um, this is his uh, his his uh, getting released on bail. And the striking thing about this form is it, it is, of course, this the, 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 a form that one filled out. But you'll note that the the proper legal we and the person's name following it. Fred there has crossed out the we and said I. He's just <laughs> he's, ta- he's he's taking ownership. He's like yes, I broke the law in this matter. Um, uh, uh, and that, that, that's the only time I saw anybody do that in any of these in, in any of these documents. Um, so released on bail, um, and then he actually ends up doing time. Fifteen thousand dollar fine. This puts him out of business for the rest of prohibition, and Rar actually does time. The vast he's the first person I found who actually had to do time in jail either. So this is this is uh, this uh, as. Uh, um, Again, I only got up through 1922, but I, I will be surprised to see another case of this, of this magnitude as we go further into Prohibition. Because, of course, I mean, over time, the feds get better at rating, uh, at, at surveilling and rating uh, places of illicit production and uh, consumption. Um, but then, of course, Wisconsin repeals Prohibition back in 1929, right? After that, it's only the feds. And the actual state, go- the, the, the representatives of the, of the state government and law enforcement, they're free to turn a blind eye to whatever kind of hijinks Wisconsinites got up to. And so I think that's another thing I'll have to keep in mind is if I ever get through the 1920s in this, uh, in this archive. Um, okay, so prohibition. This, I think that this great uh, 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 political cartoon from uh, the 1930s that I think is, I mean, people realized at the time in the late 1920s or 30s, this is why we have organized crime. This is why we have, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the dope sellers, heroin and uh, uh, cannabis and whatnot. And um, throughout the course, and then especially af- after the stock market uh, um, tanks in 1929, well, this is, um, the, the, the prohibition is, um, swiftly comes to seem like just a bad idea that we ought to get rid of. FDR campaigns on repeal, of course. And then in uh, the 22nd of March, 1933, prohibition is repealed. Breweries pay $10 million in taxes within 48 hours. So just, just, pump, just pump priming this economy, trying to get started with a new deal. Uh, by August, $54 million coming back from breweries. So somewhat ironically, the U.S. government has gone back to being reliant on taxing breweries for a substantial portion of its income, right? 
But let me summarize. Again, we, we can't, much as we might like to blame just Carrie Nation and her signed axes for all this, this is a much more complex phenomenon, right? In the WCTU, starting off with the temperance, uh, t- starting the temperance movement, uh, sort of initiating this drive towards uh, taking the country dry, the ASL, the Anti-Saloon League, is the first lobbying organization dedicated to this. Um, then I think we also have to look at the uh, things that happened in the 19 teens. The income tax frees up the government from relying on alcohol money. And then World War I. Again, we, we don't tend to think about prohibition as an outcome of World War I, but if we look at the uh, precedent set by rationing and also just this spate of anti-German sentiment, I think that it also has to um, uh, rank up there with our causes. Any questions on anything before I, before I wrap up here? Sir. Well, the they seem to uh, they seem to be in favor of prohibition from this obviously reliable document that has no has no motive or intent. The, the, they did, and I, I suspect that they're just being used for propaganda here. I mean, I strongly suspect that the, our boys coming back from World War One probably wanted to have a couple drinks when they got back. But, um, I mean, the other thing that historians, I mean, I think all of us are still wrestling with is how thoroughly we've forgotten the so-called Spanish flu pandemic, right? I mean, p- people come back to a nation that is th- th- that is suffering more casualties in our streets and buildings than we do in the trenches in Europe. Right, so I mean, it's it's a that being the context of their homecoming, uh, that would be a really interesting project to look at some of these memoirs of not just not the war itself, but what it looks like coming home. How quickly were the Germans able to fire up the whole production and make this thing a prohibition in one year? That is a perfect segue to my next slide. Here we go, because uh, <laughs> here's the thing: most of them. Uh, oops, sorry. That's this. That's this one. Most of them don't make it back. The bigger breweries like uh, Pabst, Anheuser-Busch, and the rest, they can get by uh, making other products that rely on stainless steel vessels. I mean, and, I mean, in a brewery, you can make ice cream. You can make uh, malt for various other, uh, uh, I mean, there, there's other things you can make with that type of equipment that don't make as much money, but they're legal during prohibition. Right. So for the most part, the big breweries have enough money socked away and can diversify to where they come back after Prohibition. Um, all right. It's the smaller breweries, the regional breweries, that tend to go out of business and not come back. Um, or if they do, they're rapidly gobbled up by one of the other, by one of the major brew houses. So we never get back to our pre-Prohibition peak, and then uh, the big breweries keep on gobbling up other, other smaller breweries. Right. This is when... Um, well, let's see, Miller buys, uh, Olympia buys hams, Miller buys Olympia, and then Line and Kugels. I mean, th- th- there's this process of conglomeration that just uh, uh, goes to breakneck pace uh, in the 1960s. And then we get into the home brewing. I'll come, back to, I'll come back to this shortly. I wanted to go ahead and address what I think is the second myth about prohibition, and that is that it is that it was a failure. Now... I mean, I think that the conventional understanding is that, you know, the government was trying to ban alcohol, but people could still get a drink, so it didn't really work. Is, is, is that a fair summary of, I think, popular ideas about prohibition? Okay. Uh, we can also see how it sparked, or, I mean, Al Capone, organized crime, uh, the, uh, and various other phenomena like that. But if I, I want us to, to think a bit more carefully about what it means for a public health measure to fail or succeed. Okay, because the fact is that as of 1915, the last good year for numbers prior to World War I, Americans were drinking 30 gallons of beer and 2.5 gallons of spirits per capita, 1915. That drops by two-thirds by 19, uh, sorry, that, that, that drops by over half for beer by uh, two-thirds for whiskey uh, by 1934. We don't reach that 1915 per capita consumption level until 1970. So yeah, if, if the goal was to was that nobody would ever drink alcohol again, sure, prohibition failed. If we're looking at it as a limit, uh, if we're looking at it as a uh, drive to limit the amount Americans drank, I gotta call it a smashing success, right? I mean, this is a, uh, th- this is um, 
as long as we lower our expectations a little bit and get and get the idea that nothing is going to be hundred percent, this is actually a pretty effective measure. As 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 fantastically unpopular choices by governments go. And I think the parallel here today, I mean, the, the most obvious parallel, I think, is to the current conversation about whether to uh, legalize cannabis. Um, as we all know, it is not legal in Wisconsin. Um, does that mean Wisconsinites don't get high? No? Well, but wait, it's illegal. Where do we get it? How do we get it? Be South Beloit, <laughs> you know, I mean, you can, I mean, you, you, it's, it's relatively easy to drive to Illinois, score your drugs and come back here. Uh, so this is, I mean, and this, uh, this has its parallel to prohibition prior to the Webb Canyon Act, right? If you can just go someplace else to get something, well, uh, the laws just don't matter a whole lot, right? Um, the, and, and this, uh, and just, um, I mean, I'm from Colorado originally. Colorado legalized about a decade ago, and um, uh, they have better roads than we do. They have better schools than we do. This, this is a, this is. Think about it. Legalize it, tax it. We can make millions off of this. Um, sorry, <laughs> I'm obviously a horrible propagandist for marijuana, but this is this is the most. This to me is the most uh, 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 obvious historical parallel, right? And the same kind of conversation is going on right now, and. Um, uh, whether or not Wisconsin legalizes it, Wisconsinites can already get high. It's a question whether we're going to get money off it, right? Um, if you haven't seen Reefer Madness, you should. It's it's a it's a brilliant brilliant propaganda. Um, okay, so all those brewers I mentioned that closed down, Fred Rar made a comeback. He uh, the the Rar Brewing Company comes back comes back in business after Prohibition. They actually are the sponsors of the Green Bay Packers in 1936. And although the Rar Brewery itself closes down, Fred Rar's uh, great great grandson, Fritz Rar, uh, established Rar and Sons Brewing in Fort Worth, Texas. And they're one of the major regional breweries around in uh, northern Texas. So you can't uh, you can't keep a good Rar down, I suppose, for lack of a. I had to have one bad pun. That was it. I'm sorry. Um, so to come back to breweries, this is where we are. This, I mean, prohibition puts a real ding in. Uh, the market, the big, the, the corporate giants continue to consume all their opposition until Jimmy Carter, who we can criticize for a number of things, but he legalizes home brewing, so he gets a pass from me. Um, uh, this then sparks a craft brewing uh, revolution um, to where uh, today we have, okay, so today, to, and to wrap up here, looking at the modern brewing industry, we've got the bigs on one hand and the craft brewing movement on the other. Okay, the bigs were Anheuser-Busch um, and then Saab Miller, South African breweries Miller, two large brewing corporations that had evolved to where by the 19, uh, the, the, sorry, 2000s, they're pretty much the two, the two major global corporations brewing. And then they went and merged uh, in 2016. So today, um, globally, Anheuser-Busch and Saab Miller uh, brew about a third of all beer consumed. One in three beers consumed in the world is made by one of these, is made by this mega corporation. And in the U.S., it's uh, closer to uh, almost half. Almost half of all beer is made by the same corporation in this country. On the other side of that coin, though, we've got the craft brewing revolution. Uh, as of this year, there are over 9,000 craft breweries in this country. Wisconsin, there's only, there's only 205, which um, I think is, is, is surprising, bearing in mind our history of, well, drinking, but um, perhaps not so much given how uh, powerful the Tavern League is in this state and how they've managed to pretty much keep a damper on uh, the craft revolution here. And so th this is so the, the, the choice most Americans make now going into a liquor store or a bar is do I go with a corporate beer that is uh, reliably tastes the same every time or do I go with one of these craft beers? Um, there's some really interesting research on craft brewing. I won't go into too much of it, but one is this idea, of, but one thing that emerges from this literature is the idea of neo-localism, right? That is, people want to drink something that speaks to uh, where they're from, who they are as a community, right? Thus, uh, Black, Hawk, uh, Black Hawk Porter, obviously, from Tiny Tiny Brewing. Uh, Cream City Pale Ale from Lakefront, you know, the, 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 the classic cream brick that built Milwaukee and other cities. My, my personal favorite is Polygamy Porter from Utah. Uh, uh, their tagline is, why have just one? Um, 
<laughs> so again, so the, I mean, craft breweries are about. I mean, so they're. they're uh, I think one of the, some of the more successful ones draw upon this search for community, a search for a third space outside of the home and the workplace, right? On the flip side, they also still they also cost a lot more, so that has that curtails the uh, the types of people that will buy and drink them. And all these craft breweries, they, most of them have to either get big or get bought out by one of the major corporations. That, that means that just the, 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 the economies of scale in brewing. Uh, once you have a larger brew house and more fermenters, you can just, um, uh, uh, it, it, it turns down to, it turns into a uh, production and distribution game. So this is, this is where we are today. David versus Goliath, or uh, 9,000 Davids versus Goliath. Um, but again, the craft brew has gone from 10% of the market about a decade ago to 27% today. So overall, this is the direction I think that we're heading. Sir. What kind of connection can the craft breweries take and uh, this general audience that you're talking about, is this true for most of the state? <laughs> um, the craft breweries are, um, I think taxes are by barrel produced. Uh, per, per per capita, I think. So th this is again where. Um, so this is to the advantage of larger breweries, um, and then the the one thing that happened, I know, I, th I guess about a decade ago, was that uh, Wisconsin passed a law that if you uh, sell food on site, you can't sell beer out the door unless it's in a growler. You, uh, you can't package your beer, uh, and then if you're a production brewery, you can't sell food on site. So you can either be a brew pub, and uh, most of them make about 70% of revenue off of food sales, um, but you can't package and, and, and uh, distribute, or you can be a smaller brewery, but that means you have to try and get in the distribution game where, again, the Tavern League has got it locked down. That was your first question. What was your second one? Oh, no. Um, other states are much more craft beer friendly. Uh, in my hometown of Fort Collins, there's 22 breweries in that one town. Oh, oh. Um, the, the Wisconsin is not alone in uh, getting rid of prohibition prior to other states, um, but I'd have to look into that honestly. Um, but by '33, pretty much everybody's fed up with it. I mean, it's 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 interesting to think about how much of FDR's success at the uh, uh, in the '32 election might be due to this. Um, but that's speculation, and that's for philosophers, not historians. I'll conclude. So what? Uh, prohibition. So the Second Salem, of course, another example of neo-localism, hearkening into our local, uh, slightly weird reputation. Um, so prohibition, maybe it worked. I mean, I, I, I think we have to think carefully about how we define success and failure in contexts such as these. Um, and when it comes down to, again, so for, for these breweries to keep on brewing, to come back to how they're able to get away with it, I mean, I suspect it was the, the, the local communities identified more with the brewers than they did, uh, you know, the state and feds cracking down on them wanting to get a beer, right? So I think that this is a, I think that the, the way that communities respond to <coughs> legal, uh, unpopular legal impositions from outside, I think that's probably going to be part of the story I, I'm looking for as I, get, as, as, as I get back to the archives. And then um, just in terms of what really results in what kind of alcohol is bought and consumed where, part of it is a function of law, part of it is a function of the market, part of it also these communities that I mentioned previously as well. And, uh, oh, and that's it. Okay. Um, I'll walk around here and take some of the questions. I see some hands. I'll hey, start hey, here, hey. okay? Yeah. I'm wondering about the incentive for buying for a large brewery buying a, a craft brewer. I mean, they certainly don't need the capacity. Do they? Do they buy them and shut them down to eliminate competition, or what is the reason for, the, for that? They buy them and take them over and continue selling the beer under that label. They just own it now. There's uh, the, actually the, pro <laughs> the, 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 the best example of this is I think it was the 2016 Super Bowl, you know, you know how Super Bowl ads are always like, I mean, the 30 second spot cost, I think, six million dollars last year. But um, one of them was, one of them was, um, 
I think it was Budweiser, and they're going hard on this sort of like traditional, you know, manly type beers made with barley. And we don't need any pumpkin spice porters or anything. And they had just bought a brewery that made a pumpkin spice porter like three months before the Super Bowl. So it's, um, oh yeah, so, but most of the bigs buy them to, to keep on running them, but under those, th- those craft labels, basically trying to pass for craft brew. Um, which, which is why you should always check your labels very carefully because uh, Goose Island is owned by Miller. Um, a lot of the formal, like, uh, a lot of breweries that start out as craft are now owned by one of the bigs, right? We're all here in the room. Yeah. Marion. Uh, you had six uh, labels over here that seemed to come from Whitewater. Yeah. Well, I, know, I know Second Salem, but where are th- the rest of them brewed? Oh, these are all Second Salem labels. Yeah. The the old main, uh, the Reapers. I think they're wheat beer. The Porter, uh, the Witch Tower Pale. I thought of all these labels, by the way, when I was st- when I was helping start Second Salem. The names are mine. And then uh, Area Fifty Three is our Pilot Proof Bone Orchard IPA. I mean, they they they, they, each, they each draw into some element of Second Salem uh, mythology. How common was the Elliot Ness syndrome where you see some of the federal officers going around busting up barrels of booze and what have you? <laughs> That's an excellent question. And um, one of the, uh, let's see, in the cases that I have found, again, all district court cases from Milwaukee, which is the eastern half of the state. I, I, ha- I haven't even done the western half of the state yet. This is going to take years. But um, the, w- the one person whose name turned up more than anybody else is a guy named, I think, Hennessy, who starts off as one of the feds doing some of these busts. Um, and I actually found a transcript of one of his, uh, of him in the, uh, of him testifying during the court case. And he was just, oh, sorry, he was the, the prosecutor. And he was just, I mean, just being really rude and uncivil to the person accused of um, bootlegging. Uh, and then a couple years later, he turns up as the defendant for a couple of people accused of, of uh, breaking the law. So he, I think he saw, I think he, he saw which side of the road the money was to be made on. Um, so I, um, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, the, you, you, you're going to find crusaders in every organization, right? Um, Probably um, didn't happen much in Whitewater. <laughs> it's hard to say. But you remember also how The Untouchables ends when some reporter asks, asks uh, Kevin Costner what he's going to do now that Prohibition's over. Remember what he says? I believe I'll have a drink. <laughs> 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 okay. Yes, please. I would think that the Depression had a, a real uh, something to do with, you know, the not drinking a lot because I remember my mother telling us that dad got a nickel on Friday night to buy his beer for the week. He got one nickel beer. I, I, your, your mom sounds like a smart lady for one thing. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, during, during the, the Depression, I mean, you simply couldn't afford uh, to drink, and so so that so thank you because the the lower levels of drinking, of course, has other causes. That's the main one, right? That people can afford to, absolutely. But um, I think one of the more unexpected elements of prohibition was that again going back to how I mean saloons again were very much male coded spaces, right? Only men would go into those. Um, so the um, the the, the striking thing here is that once you, so you have places women are forbidden to go into, but once drinking moves to uh, non-public spaces, there's no particular reason women can't enter those. So prohibition actually leads to modern non-gender segregated uh, bars and drinking. And, and th- th- there's this really great article on prohibition in Butte, Montana, where all the saloons close down and they open up the next day as soda parlors. Uh, why wouldn't women be able to go into soda parlors, right? So there, there's the, 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 the gender element there plays really interesting there as well. Any other questions? <coughs> well, Dr. Brown will stick around for a few minutes, I'm sure. I wanted to um, remind you that we have a flyer for the remaining 
um, lectures in the series. We still have a few left, along with a couple of lectures that we're holding in the Community Engagement Center, the first of which is tomorrow evening. So if you're interested in either of those things, go ahead and grab one of those flyers. But please join me in thanking Dr. Carl Brown. And thank you for coming.